Welcome to City Cinema Tech, where the art and pleasure of the movies are the subject of serious discussion. I'm your host, Jerry Carlson, and I teach film studies at the City College of the City University of New York. Today we're continuing our series, Soviet Literary Adaptations, and we actually have a very unusual example. It was shot in Kazakhstan, it's called The Fierce One, and it's the story of the relationship of a boy and a wolf. And this is a real wolf we're going to be looking at. You might call the film a little bit of The Call of the Wild meets Never Cry Wolf. It's a fascinating work, and it's a very unusual one. Uh, in fact, uh, we have the only print in North America of this, and it is dubbed in English, something we don't normally do, but I think this film merits our attention. We'll be talking about its portrayal of nature, of the particular nomadic society where it takes place, and a number of other things after today's screening. Joining us once again on City Cinema Tech will be Professor Louis Menashe, a noted expert on Soviet and Russian cinema. Now, enjoy this unusual opportunity to journey to Kazakhstan in The Fierce One. Welcome back to City Cinematheque. I hope you've enjoyed this journey to two places, uh, into the Soviet film industry in the 1970s and into a film that itself uh, wishes to uh, visit uh, the Kyrgyzian nomadic peoples during uh, czarist times. I think these are two very unusual features for any uh, movie to show up on American television. Uh, there's a great deal to discuss about this, I think, uh, very interesting uh, film and its circumstances. And it's a pleasure to welcome back to City Cinematheque, a good friend of this uh, series and show, um, uh, Louis Menashe, who is a professor emeritus at the Polytechnic Institute of New York uh, University. Uh, Louis has recently, he's been writing about Russian and Soviet film for well over 20 years, and I'm happy uh, to say that much of that writing has recently been gathered in an edited volume called Moscow Does Believe in Tears, playing, of course, on the Academy Award-winning film Moscow Doesn't Believe uh, in, in Tears. I highly recommend the book, and I can say that because I wrote one of the blurbs on the back of it. So, <laughs> full disclosure here, Louis, full disclosure. Well, thank you very, very much, uh, Jerry. It's a pleasure to be here. Right. It's a pleasure to have your endorsement. <laughs> pleasure to have that introduction. And um, uh, I look forward to an interesting discussion about Good. Kyrgyzia. Well, well, We're yeah. here in the wolf's lair, you might say, after seeing this film, right? A absol <laughs> absolutely, absolutely the case. So let's, let's just start. This is a film from the mid-1970s. Mm -hmm. So let's just start a little bit with how the Russian, the Soviet, most importantly, film industry is organized. I mean, everybody who has watched Russian film will see from that era, will see, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the, the branding of it, of the big statuette that comes up from Soviet export film, etc. People obviously know about the center of filmmaking in Moscow with, obviously, the rival at that point, um, satellite of Leningrad, uh, when it was Leningrad, when and not it was Leningrad, when it right. was when it was Leningrad. So, what's the status of the of filmmaking in this vast country, the republics, and then actually in of the Kyrgyz? Yeah, uh, film well, is well, it's interesting you raise this whole issue because when people hear Soviet, they think Russian, right. and that all Soviet films are Russian films. In fact, there were fifteen constituent republics. Each of them had their own film industry, ultimately controlled by the Communist Party, which had representatives in each of the right. republics. Um, and there were some really notable developments in those peripheral industries. Ukrainian, I think, above all, and the Georgian. The Kyrgyz does not fit into the A-list, I don't think. Right. But they had a very, very interesting a uh, series of developments beginning in the 1960s, actually. Why? Um, there was a group of Moscow filmmakers, including a uh, documentary filmmaker by the name of Leonid Gurievich, um, who felt they were stifled by the usual Moscow bureaucrats. And they tried heading out to what they considered virgin territory, virgin okay. lands, and Kyrgyzia was their target. Why exactly Kyrgyzia? I'm not exactly sure. But they settled in uh, uh, what was called at the time Frunza, 
Hmm. Frunza, Mikhail Frunza was a hero of the Civil War, and mm -hmm. he was a native Kyrgyz, actually of mixed parentage, but he came from uh, the, uh, the, the region. Uh, and they began developing a, uh, an independent, a kind of independent. Right. In, anytime you're away from Moscow, okay. you have the imprimatur of independence, away from Moscow controls, away from Moscow bureaucrats, uh, and so on. Uh, and Gurievich and, and others developed a film uh, culture in Kyrgyzia. Right. And uh, our guy, Akeyev, was part of that. Uh, Tolomush Okeyev. Okeyev was part of that. He helped develop the Kyrgyz film industry. As a matter of fact, you know, he died in uh, 2001, and the Kyrgyz film studio today is named after him. Okay. Uh, and Guryevich and others brought in some talent from uh, the heartland. Okay. Among them, Andre, as he was known then, Mikhalkov Konchalevsky. Right, absolutely. Uh, and his first film was shot in Kyrgyzia based on a uh, story by, oh, actually a script by Aitmatov, Chinggis Aitmatov, a Kyrgyz, famous Kyrgyz uh, right. writer uh, called First Teacher. A wonderful film. Uh, and I think much better than some of the recent stuff Konchalovsky uh, right. has done. Uh, and uh, I hope you've noticed and viewers have noticed that he co-scripted this film that we've just seen. Uh, and Konchalovsky being one of those, you know, with, with his ha half-brother uh, Nikita Mikhailkov and with the late Andrei Tarkovsky and perhaps with Sokolov. Now, are the only sort of names that have been exported onto the auteur list, right. you know, right. uh, in, in the West. And so I was, I think it's a fascinating feature that, uh, that, that you find his signature as a screenwriter yeah, on, yeah. This, on this film. Oh, yeah. And what's also fascinating that he was still identified as Michalkov Konchalovsky, the Michalkov side coming from, uh, of course, his father, who is a, a Soviet uh, author and the author of the national anthem, as right. a matter of fact, both in Soviet and post-Soviet times. Right. Uh, and the Konchalovsky side uh, from his mother, uh, of an artistic uh, background. Right. And then by the late 70s and early 80s, I interviewed him in uh, 1982, and I, um, I said, it's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Mikhalkov Konchalovsky. Uh, and he said, just call me Konchalovsky. Oh, okay. Uh, and so then began, uh, you know, his uh, departure or distinction from right. his brother, after all. Mikhalkov, Nikita Mikhalkov, was a uh, you know reputable actor and a great director himself. That's absolutely right. Um, and um, and first teacher is a, is a wonderful film. If you have the occasion well, to do so, please show it. Well, <laughs> the, the, you, 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 by by making that recommendation, you actually raise a very interesting uh, I I issue, and that is the issue of a vast body of film that was made inside the Soviet Union, uh, certainly from Moss film and from Len film, but from uh, all of these r r republics. Mm -hmm. And the question, in many ways, is. Where are those films now? I mean, to what degree are they accessible even in the republics and Russia? And yeah. certainly there's the question that raised, you know, by some of those film historians lose sleep over things like this of, wow, that's a lot of films. Were all of them great? Not, n n we all know they weren't. But is it possible that there are really extraordinary films yeah. that for these material conditions of politics and preservation, mm -hmm. you know, we just uh -huh. don't know about. And I think yeah. today's film is one of those examples, and it is, you know, I, as I said to our viewers beforehand, where I showed it in a dubbed edition, yes. uh, the, which I never do yes. on the show. Yeah. But Good. why did I show it? But by the way, a, an excellent dubbing, I thought, and uh, done in Paris. Uh, yeah, yeah, I noticed that, uh, and uh, much, much better than the usual run-of-the-mill dubbing. Well, and and <laughs> very reminiscent, by the way. You would almost think, in one sense, you were watching an Italian film of that era, in which they were all dubbed because yeah. of the Italian yeah. Yeah. method. And it's like watching yeah. a Sergio Leone film, uh, <laughs> you know, from the mid '70s, in which you know everybody has. Yeah. Uh, has been dubbed, but uh, this is a film that um, an American distributor, uh, which was doing a great deal of business in Corinth, the mid Corinth, Corinth, Corinth yeah. in the seventies, seventies uh, and the eighties, they chose to to to, to bring uh, uh, to bring out, and it it raises that issue. I mean, what other sort of gems are 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 are, are, are there? 
uh, in these places? Well, uh, I, I would say there are, and uh, you have to look for them. Uh, I think um, the Film Society at Lincoln Center a couple of years ago ran a whole series on Central Asian films. Of, the, of the Silk Road, it was the Silk Road exactly, series. Exactly, exactly, right. from Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan and, and, and uh, Kyrgyzia yeah. as well. But generally, when we speak of the peripheries, we don't think of Central Asia. Right. Uh, we think of Ukraine. We think of Georgia in particular, Absolutely. which has generated a magnificent body of work. Right. Um, and, um, and to a certain extent, the Baltic republics, including Latvia, especially for documentary film. Okay. They pioneered, I think, the great, great documentary tradition right. of, of modern Soviet times and post-Soviet times right. as, uh, as well. Um, uh, I, I think in, you know in the 19 in the 1920s in the golden age of of uh, Soviet silent cinema, right. we do get a little of Dovzhenko, for example, yeah, who comes from uh, Ukraine. Uh, but in general, you're absolutely right. We do not see what has been going on in the outliers. Right. And this is uh, an example of some of the fine work that's been done and belongs to, interestingly enough the 1970s, uh, Absolutely. Which, which I think is the golden decade of Soviet film. Okay. Uh, yes, the, the silent period and their Dovzhenkos and Eisensteins and Pudovkins and, and so on uh, are up there. Uh, but the 1970s uh, witnessed the Konchalovskys and the Mikhalkovs and the Sukhorov is not not yet. But not, it, he's not allowed to be screened. He's already starting to, to uh, work, um, and it's only in the Glasnost period and thereafter that we begin to, to see his work. But there's Panfilov, uh, there's Klimov, and we can include uh, Comrade Okeyev uh, well, as, as, as well. Absol yeah. absol absolutely. And so I he's want part of that, you know, that what I call the golden decade of Soviet films. Okay. So why... Uh, let's go back. This is a film made in the in the mid 1970s. Mm -hmm. In this, you know, in this uh, climate mm -hmm. of the fact that n filmmakers are able to negotiate a mm -hmm. relationship mm -hmm. with uh, with with the state, and I, I, I use that word, um, you know, intentionally of negotiate because as, as I, I was chatting with somebody about another country another day, and somebody was asking, well, where's the line? And they said, well, that's the whole negotiation is you never exactly. know where the line is, exactly. and so you're constantly looking for clues about where the line is on what you can and cannot do, and mm -hmm. sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. So why this kind of project in the mid-1970s? Um, this is a film that ultimately is a rather pessimistic film. Boy, is it pessimistic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it does not have what the Russians called a happy ending. <laughs> um, uh, I, I think it has to do with the nature of, uh, and the personality and uh, aesthetic of the director himself. Okay. Um, He's trained in Leningrad and Moscow. He's not a graduate of the, the famous film school uh, in Moscow. And he's a sound person originally, okay. specializing in sound. And uh, he has a thing, you might call it a fetish, for um, animals in motion, particularly horses in motion. Mm -hmm. His first film is a short, I think, 10-minute wordless documentary about horses in various... Uh, segments of motion. Okay. Um, and so, uh, you know, you come to, to this film, and it seems to me it's almost as if he was more interested in animals in the wild, um, in motion. There, Correct. There's Absolutely. a lot of motion. No car chases, but <laughs> there, are, there are horse chases <laughs> uh, and wolf chases. Um, and it's almost as if he's more interested in capturing the fierce, if we can uh, address the title, right. everything is fierce. The land is fierce, Absolutely. the characters are fierce, uh, the animals are fierce. He's interested in capturing that element and into it he integrates a narrative um, rather than the other way around, I think. I, you know, uh, this well, is my interpretation of the film. And I, I found the most striking parts of the film precisely those elements when beast and man, uh, you know, are in the frame. Um, beginning with the wonderful montage over the titles. Right. Uh, there's some magnificent music there. 
uh, and then a series of stills as the uh, credits are, are uh, rolling. Well, I, I have to say that this is, again, I, I uh, mentioned in my introduction uh, to the audience, I, I, I joked that this is a little bit of the Call of the Wild meets Carol Ballard's rather well-known <laughs> film, Never Cry Wolf. Never Cry Wolf, exactly. Uh, yeah, and and yeah. one of the remarkable things about this, because I'm, I'm going to follow your line of re reasoning here, is uh, he... he it's not only, uh, I, I think it's a, a two-level uh, issue with, with him. He actually gets us in proximity to these animals in the wild. Yes. So you might say yes. that there's a little bit of the traditional National Geographic or yes. Discovery Channel yes. aspect to it of, I don't spend much time close to wolf, wolf packs. Right. And so there's just the sort of thrill of being able to inspect on mm -hmm. almost whatever terms. Mm -hmm. But then and this is, I, I, I'm just agreeing with you, then what's remarkable is that, that he manages to capture this in this docudrama way in which clearly he uses the power of cinema not merely to capture but to express. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. uh, yep. so with, with, it's just you're talking. He's very interested in movement, yes. but that also means that he's interested in the movement of the camera. Yes. He's interested, some of these sequences are really quite remarkable in right. terms of their editing. Right, uh, right. So right. that the, the uh, for example, the attack of the wolf pack upon the, uh, you know, the, the, the the, the, well, the, 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 the sheep, sheep and also the rider. A yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, the uh, uncle, yeah. Yeah, yeah. These are remarkable sequences yeah. for, yeah. you know, the fact that th these are not uh, these are not digital or robotic. That's exactly uh, that's exactly a p uh, 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 the point I wanted to make as well. Uh, and you notice there was no disclaimer. It didn't say oh, well. no <laughs> animals have been harmed in the course of filming this. Uh, those were actual attacks uh, by wolf packs on sheep, yeah. and, and some of them are really quite graphic. I'm not sure about the the falcon in that early scene. Right. You know, the un uncle's falcon, uh, not the uncle, uh, Hassan's falcon, yeah, right. um, uh, attacking what looks like a wolf, perhaps, right? Um, I, I'm not sure about that. It looked very, very real. Now, I notice there is a credit for special effects, so maybe there was some element of that. Well, but certainly the other scenes showing the wolf packs attacking the sheep, uh, this is, uh, you know, well, it's the, heavy, it's the real deal, stuff. as we yeah, say. Yeah, heavy stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, also, I mean, the point is that, that falconry is a, you know, a sport with a trained, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. bird involved. So you can, you know, I don't, I don't know how... <laughs> From, from a production point of view, I don't know how many, how many times they had to go out and ha, yeah, how much yeah, footage they right, had to use right. and do that, but you can stage that in a certain kind of sure. way. You go out with you, 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 you go sure. out with the, the Falcon Master and then right. and then you work until uh, uh, until you get it. Patience, patience, patience. Well, yeah. well as um, as uh, the, the the German filmmaker Volker Schlondorf, who worked as a very young man with the great French filmmaker. Uh, Anna René, uh -huh. he was completely awed by him, and he tells this charming story. He said, René made a decision one day that he just thought was just brilliant on the on, on the set, and he said, and, he, and just with his youthful enthusiasm, he says, "That's that's brilliant." Yeah. And René said, he said, uh, "I don't know about that. I, I know it's the product of patience." <laughs> ah, there you go. <laughs> that's what I know yeah, uh, yeah, about yeah, this. You get the right thing through patience. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and determination. And serendipity. Well, abs and serendipity. A absolutely. Uh, th they didn't uh, coach these wolves, uh, <laughs> you know, to attack at this precise moment. I think they waited for right. the uh, f for that moment. Right. Uh, and yeah, the filming was, I thought, quite extraordinary. And uh, beginning with that v that opening shot right. of the um, the horsemen in the distance on that you know in that wide panorama which reminded me of, you remember Shane, uh, when Sh sure. Shane's first appearance is on horseback, right. uh, you know, um, in this panoramic uh, shot. And we have a lot of that in the course uh, of the yeah, film. Absolutely. And I, I want to point out that, that at this era where we're 10 to 15 years into the international success of the of the so-called spaghetti westerns. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And uh, the use that the Italian directors made of the Spanish landscape and the way in which that right. that is really a globally popular right. phenomenon right. is something that 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 this film touches on in the sense that okay, well we can make this kind of film that has a kind of savage um, 
visual elegance mm -hmm. and poetry to it with the man against the landscape, the animal against the la landscape. Um, uh, and that this, you have to say that this is a, a cinema, this is a prestige cinema for export. This may be doing very well in the domestic, but there yeah. you, can, you can see that they're thinking this is a film that may have a place in the international yeah, yeah. market. That's an interesting way to situate uh, uh, the film. Um, by the way, uh, is, uh, filming in Spain, this film was shot in Kazakhstan. I'm not quite sure why exactly, because right. Kyrgyzia is pretty rugged itself. Y yeah. it, you know, it's a wild, mountainous uh, country, landlocked with a ma big, magnificent uh, lake, Isukul, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yes, it has all of these elements. It's, uh, it's uh, wolf against uh, man, wolf against sheep, um, man against man, and man is wolf to man, to quote that wonderful old uh, Latin expression. Well, that's, uh, thank you uh, mm -hmm. of, of, for, for what you've just said, because I was about to say it in a slightly different way, that mm -hmm. the way in which you can put these sequences together, I mean, the, the dramatic storyline that has mm -hmm. developed, and these extraordinary nature sequences, mm -hmm. and both as they're captured and as they're edited, mm -hmm. w uh, the word I would use is um, predation. I mean, what mm -hmm. this is mm -hmm. this is a predatory world mm -hmm. we have entered at every possible level. Mm -hmm. Now, my question to you, <laughs> Professor Menashe, yes. is: It's the middle of the 1970s. What is the significance <laughs> of making a film in the Soviet Union yeah. about a predatory world? Mind you, it's set during Tsarist times. Yes. Okay. Yes. But you know what? How do you? Well, we ha what's we the have implication to, of that? All right, but we have to think Soviet message as well. You know. He, okay, that's he, fine. He, he 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 wants to make a film showing animals in the wild and their predatory nature and so on. Okay. And he also wants to show. The predatory nature of individuals and social structures, and and that's of course what Uncle tries to teach the kid. You know, this is a fierce world out there, kid, Absolutely. and you better shape up. You know, yeah. man up, as uh, as we say now. Uh, but it is also a Soviet film, so he has to integrate into the narrative um, something that is Soviet. What is Soviet about it? Well, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Hassan Hassan is a rebel, right? Okay. He speaks up when the son of what they call the master. The master, of course, is the bey. This is still, you know, feudal time. Absolutely. It's part of the Russian Empire. Kyrgyzia is part of the Russian Empire. It's conquered by the Tsars in the, in the 1860s, but they allow certain feudal traditions to right. e exist. Uh, so um, Hassan speaks out against the bey. Hassan was imprisoned in Siberia, escaped from Siberia, and he preaches the message of we must not behave as wolves ourselves. Right, absolutely uh, correct. And you cannot fight evil with evil. So, you know, we've smuggled in a very, very Soviet dimension. He's a proto-revolutionary. Yeah, 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 yeah. And by the way, there's, uh, so, uh, again, bringing, bringing us back to Konchalovsky, or as he was known then, Mikhalkov Konchalovsky, <laughs> in, in Siberiad, which is his wonderful epic film. Which we've shown on this series. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, another, another case of, you know, the wild and the right. attractiveness of, uh, of Central Asian, Siberian landscapes, and right. so on. There is a character in there, a revolutionary, um, who preaches to the village uh, and who is led away by czarist security officers. Okay. That scene is, um, is antedated by, that, by the scene in this film where Hassan is carted away by czarist security right. officers. Um, so I, I would say that you know that's the Soviet part of uh, right. the the, uh, the the whole construct here, and, and and you know to my mind every time I see that kind of Soviet construct in yes. a film, particularly from these you know very very smart filmmakers who know yes. who know their storytelling very well, there's a way in which that official Soviet message can 
be interpreted not exactly as anti-Soviet, but as, but can be undermined because anytime you have a structure in which you have people carting people away, yeah. that brings to mind whatever situations in which people are carted away unjustly. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah. you can always say, it's well, we're the... Universe, a universal message. Uh, yeah, yeah, abs yeah, absolutely the case. Yeah, yeah absolutely yeah, the yeah, case. Yeah. Um, but um, uh, the very setting of the film, you know, uh, you know, is a, um, uh, a Soviet-style setting. It's pre-revolutionary. Uh, okay. It's the beginning of the century. Um, feudal social structures uh, still exist. The bay has 5,000 sheep and five wives, and um, poor, poor uncle says, well, you know, he's stolen, again, you know, yeah, yeah. A, a good Marxist um, examination of the issue. Uh, he has stolen our wealth, right. right? I can steal from him, right? right? Um, so, you know, there are these interesting elements, but it, it, again, it seems to me that uh, filmmakers at that time had their personal visions and they had to fit them into what was permissible uh, by the Soviet film bosses. Okay, that, that is going to be our exit line today, but I think it's a very good summary statement, mm -hmm. not only for this film, but for mm -hmm. the way we've been looking at Soviet literary adaptations mm -hmm. throughout this entire uh, series. If you'd like to know more about this particular series, Soviet literary adaptations, more generally about City Cinema Tech, or more generally further about uh, City University Television, you can do so by visiting our website. Please visit www.cuny.tv. There you're going to find click-ons for this particular series, other programming, and you'll also find click-ons to communicate with CUNY TV. We always welcome your commentary, and if you'd like to be on our uh, e-list for City Cinematheque, you'll find a click-on for that as well. So please visit www.cuny.tv. Louis, always a pleasure having you well, here. My pleasure, Good. Jerry. Thanks, Good. So, thanks so Good. much. Thanks so much. Uh, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll look uh, forward to having you back yet again. Uh, all right. And thank you for joining us here today on City Cinematheque. I hope you join us again as we stroll through the archives of film history. Bye-bye for now.